Feast today, a summer series that is simply entitled I Am, uh, and it refers to the seven I Am statements of Jesus uh, concerning who he was. It's, it's so important for us to know who our Lord is. Uh, we know much about him. But I spoke to someone a while back who just came to the realization that Jesus is God. He's not only the Son of God, but he is God in the flesh. And that was a new truth to this person I was talking to. Uh, if you've been here for any length of time, you know um, about the deity of Christ and who he was in that sense. But in the Gospel of John, uh, he shares with us seven different pictures, so to speak, or um, descriptions of who he is. And they all begin with that same phrase. In John 6 this morning, we'll learn that he calls himself the bread of life. In chapter 8 of Gospel of John, he's called the light of the world. He says, I am the light of the world. In John chapter 10, verses 7 to 9, he says, I am the door, or the gate. And then in chapter 10, verses 11 and 14, he calls himself the good shepherd. In chapter 11, verse 25, he calls himself the resurrection and the life. And then in John 14, 6, he calls himself the way, the truth, and the life. And then in John 15, chapter number one, uh, chapter 15, verse 1, he says, I am the true vine. Those are the seven I am statements of the Lord in the Gospel of John. With each of these revelations, a basic need is met in Christ. And with each of these revelations, an invitation is extended our text this morning is in John chapter 6, verse number 35, and also verses 47 to 58, uh, where Jesus presents himself as the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Look at verse John, John chapter 6, and verse number 35. It says there, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And then John, 40, uh, John 6, verse 47 and following, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And then he goes on to say, verse um, 52, the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat of the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, I live by the Father. So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which come down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Here in the Gospel of John, which is a very significant gospel, uh, unlike the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, John presents Jesus specifically as the Son of God. 
His deity is um, the primary emphasis in the Gospel of John. I believe John is probably one of the easiest Gospels to understand and read. Uh, It's not as easy to teach, but it's a wonderful gospel in the Word of God. And all of these statements are mentioned there. uh, And they all begin with the same phrase, I am. I am. Jesus fed the 5,000 earlier on in this chapter with just five loaves of bread and two, it says, small fishes. He fed 5,000 men. It didn't include women and children, so it could have been many more people. The Bible says 5,000 men, but there were also women and children there. It was a great miracle that he performed there. And after that miracle, he sent his disciples across the Sea of Galilee. Remember when they were in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, a a strong wind began to blow and they thought they were going to sink and they looked over and they saw Jesus walking on the water and it said they were afraid because they thought that he was a ghost. And what was Jesus' response? He says, be not afraid, it is I. It is I. And the significant thing about that statement in the Greek language, I know that, you know, I'm not Greek. I don't really speak fluent Greek, and you're probably not Greek either. But just realize that the New Testament was translated from Koine Greek, the common language of the day. The Greek words for I am, or rather for for it is I, is ego I me, ego I me. And literally, it's translated, I am. I am. So when Jesus said, be not afraid, it is I, he literally identified himself with the great I am. If you look in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13, and Moses said unto God, behold, when I came unto the children of Israel and shall say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you and they shall say to me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shall ye say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. So Jehovah said, My name is I am. Jesus said, Ego I me, which means I am. Don't be afraid, I am. And everything about these I am statements that we're going to study over the next several weeks identifies Jesus as God, the I am. It highlights his deity in our thinking. And we learned a new aspect of who he is with each of these statements. John 8 verse 58 says, Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Am Again, the same words in the Greek, ego, I, me. So in this statement where he says, I am the bread of life, Jesus used a physical need to show a spiritual need, to reveal a spiritual need. Uh, This he began again back in verses 1 to 14 when he fed the 5,000. Now, these were people who came to hear him preach, And they had been there all day, and they were hungry. Do you know what it's like to be hungry? I wonder how many of us really do know what it's like to be hungry. We live in a land of plenty. We live in a country, ladies and gentlemen, where even the poorest citizens have access to some food, some way. But many of us have never really felt hunger, not as they did. And when you're really hungry, a piece of bread goes a long way. And so Jesus used a physical need, hunger, to present a spiritual truth. He said, you know, you understand what bread is, right? Bread. Y'all like bread? Bread was the most important part of the meal in those days. Even today, it's called the staff of life. Whenever we go to a restaurant, we generally focus on the entree. 
that we order. But uh, let me just say a few the, a few restaurant names and see if you can identify with me, okay? Olive Garden. What do you like at Olive Garden? Thank you. Breadsticks. I like the salad too, but breadsticks. What about uh, Texas Roadhouse? Rolls that that are slathered with butter. Uh, and what about Red Lobster? Cheese biscuits. How many can eat about 50 of those? You know, it, 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 there's something about bread. In those days, in Jesus' days, meat was just a side dish. Bread represented the major part of the meal. When Jesus says that he is the bread of life, he's saying that he's the most important part of life. Jesus, the bread of life. Everyone had access to bread in those days. Even the poorest of the poorest, they used barley to make bread, while the wealthier used wheat, but most everyone had the means to make or buy bread. By using this metaphor, Jesus is saying that he is available to everyone. Bread was a means of fellowship, as it still is today. We used the phrase breaking bread together. It was literally something that in those days brought you closer together as, as friends. If you broke bread with someone, uh, you know, you, you, you became their friend. Bread symbolizes God's presence. Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem, right? Bethlehem. Do you know what Bethlehem means? House of bread. Isn't that interesting? House of bread. That's what Bethlehem means. The, the, this bread was a heavenly symbol of God himself and reminder to his people that every time they eat bread, they should think of him. You know, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, what was Jesus doing when he instituted the Lord's Supper? They were eating. They were eating. And he took the elements of the table. He picked up bread and broke it and gave it to them. And what did he say? This is my body. Now, did that bread magically become his body? No, no. It was, it was a symbol. It represented him. And it was so wise of him to do that. Because Jesus knew that every single time after that, that they ate bread... They would remember that time and never forget him. That's why we have the Lord's Supper today. It isn't to impart some kind of grace or to make you saved or make you more saved. It is to remember the body that was broken because of our sin. The bread is just a symbol of him. Bread is important. Jesus knew what he was doing when he called himself the bread of life. In this passage, we see that there are many reasons that men seek after Jesus. Look at verse 22, back in chapter 6. Verse 22. There we read, The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save that one whereinto his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone. Howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they did eat bread. After that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Now think about it. They saw the disciples get in the ship and go across the sea, didn't they? They didn't see Jesus get in the ship. Something happened that night that they didn't see. Jesus came walking on the water, right? They didn't see that. So all of a sudden he appears on the other side of the sea and they said, how did you get here? We didn't see you get on the boat. How did you get here? And then Jesus answered them, this is a strange answer. Really strange. They didn't expect it. He said unto them, verse 26, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because you saw the miracles, 
but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Isn't that strange? What a response. Here are these people that were seeking after Jesus to the point that they took shipping and went across the sea and they came to him and said, how did you get here? We missed you. We didn't see you leave. And his response was, instead of saying, well, thank you, I I missed you all. I'm glad that you came over here to see me. He said, look, you're not here because you're seeking me or saw the miracles. You're here because you were hungry and you knew I had bread. They were seeking him for what they could get. And there's so many today that are seeking Jesus for what they can get. I'll come to Jesus as long as you answer my prayers. I'll come to Jesus as long as I can get this or as long as you can do this for me. But when they don't get what they want, they turn their back and run away. I mean, I read that and I said, how in the world could you have sat there in that crowd of 5,000 people? And seen Jesus take five barley loaves and two little fishes and multiply that to the extent that he could feed all these people. How could you not see that this was impossible for man and that only God could do such a thing? Well, evidently they did. They were so enamored about Well, we can get bread. He can give us bread. We're going to go where he is so we can get bread. It points to our motives for why we seek Jesus. You know, folks, I'm convinced that there are many people today who are seeking because they're hungry. What are they hungry for? They're hungry for something, for Anything that will fill the void that they find in their lives. The void that they've tried to fill with everything this world has to offer, but it's still there. They're experiencing spiritual hunger pangs and nothing in this world can fill it. They try everything, but nothing fills that void that only Jesus can fill. C.S. Lewis put it like this. If I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. And if we settle for material things, we'll hunger again. It's just like if you eat this physical bread you'll get hungry again. Jesus said, but if you take of me, you'll never ever hunger again. You'll never thirst again. If we partake of the bread of life, our hunger will be taken care of and all of our needs will be met. Jesus used a simple thing like bread to teach a profound spiritual message that only he can fill the void in your life. It's amazing to me that People spend an entire lifetime searching, searching for that next thing that will fill that emptiness in their life. People think, well, if I just had enough money, then I would be happy. If I just had the right woman, I would, I would be happy. Or if I just had the right man, I would be happy. Or if I could just have children, I could be happy. Or if I just had a better job, I would be happy If I was more famous, then I would be happy. And they searched their entire life for the bluebird of happiness, and they never find it. And you never will find it until you come to the bread of life. The next thing I want you to notice in verse 27 is the superiority of the spiritual. He says in verse 27, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Everyone has a need for spiritual bread, a need that can only be satisfied through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if man does not eat that bread, He will not only die physically, 
he will die spiritually. If he doesn't accept Christ as his personal Savior, he will be dead eternally. But the good news is nobody has to die. Nobody has to die. Verse, uh, John chapter 3, verse 18. You know the verse 16, right? For God so loved the world and he gave his only begotten son. You know verse 18? John 3, 18. He that believeth on him, Jesus, is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So the only thing a person has to do to go to hell is nothing because he's already condemned. Already condemned to hell. But in order to go to heaven, in order to have eternal life, the only thing a person has to do is take the bread of life. Eat the bread of life. Look at John 6, 49. Your fathers did eat manna. You know what manna is, right? Manna, it means what is it? (laughs) It was a special food that God created to feed his people. And he made it for them. And they had to go and pick it up every day. They couldn't store it up. If they stored it up, it would go bad. For each day, except on the Sabbath, they had to pick it up themselves. If a man won't work, he won't eat. They had to go out and pick it up. He says, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. They ate physical bread and they're dead. He said, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world, his flesh. Thus, we come to the invitation. As it says in Psalm 34, 8, come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Verse 37, all that the Father giveth unto me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. We must come to Christ, the bread of life. Question. If you had bread on your table, that's all you had, and you never ate it, you just walked by it every day and looked at it, but you never ate it. What would eventually happen to you? You would die of hunger. You have this bread and it's right in front of you. In order for you to live and survive, what must you do? You must eat it. You must take it in your life. And likewise, we can know about Jesus. We can have heard the gospel before. But unless we personally appropriate Christ in our life, then we're still condemned. We still need to be saved. Christ, we can believe all we want to intellectually that there was a Jesus. History will back it up. We can believe all we want to that if Jesus died for people's sins and our sins could be forgiven. But until the time that we personally appropriate Christ... And receive him into our life. We're still lost. John 6.53 says something really strange. It says, Then Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Is he proposing that we become cannibals? Obviously not, but he's making a a point here that Christ himself, the bread of life, must be taken in our lives. He must be personally appropriated. I can't take him in for you. You must take him in yourself. Salvation is a personal issue between you and God. You must personally appropriate faith in what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary for you, not just for the world, but for you personally. Jesus died on the cross for me. 
He died on the cross for you. The whole world, yes, but you must receive that yourself. Bread has to be eaten in order to receive its benefits. So every individual must personally receive Jesus in their lives. Again, you can have that bread in front of you. You can know what it is. You can know the facts about how the, the nutrients within that, that bread blesses your body and makes you healthy. But until you pick up the piece of bread and eat it, it has no benefit in your life. And the problem I'm seeing today is we live in a world full of intellectuals. We live in a world full of information. It's the information age. And so many people know about Jesus. And they can even tell you the verses about Jesus that they've learned, but they've never personally accepted him. And they're still lost. They're still condemned. So my question for you this morning is this invitation in verse 37 is, have you ever personally received Jesus as your Savior? Or is it that you just know about him? He's there. But have you ever personally made a decision and you said, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm condemned because of my sin. The Bible says so. Jesus, I realize that you died on the cross of Calvary to save sinners like me. Thus, Jesus, right now, before you, I trust what you did on the cross of Calvary to be sufficient to pay for my sins. Would you please save my soul, come into my life, and help me to live for you? That's what being saved is about. It isn't about jumping hoops or having feelings. It's about intellectual, a decision that you make that is brought about by the Spirit of God in your life. Do you know what it's like to be convicted of your sin by the Spirit? Have you ever experienced the conviction of the Holy Spirit? I did when I was just 11 years old. I was standing in church during a VBS campaign and the pastor began to preach and he mentioned hell. That hell was the real place. And that people without God would end up in hell. And I didn't want to go to hell. And so I really began to think about that. What would happen if I died today? And I didn't want to die and go to hell. And so I went forward at the invitation. The pastor explained to me the, the, the free salvation that I can have in Jesus Christ. And that day, at an 11-year-old, I didn't have all the eloquence you know, of an adult. I just knew I wanted to be saved. And I accepted Jesus as my personal Savior. I knew what that conviction was like. I didn't want to let go of that pew. My fingers was digging in the bark in that pew. I didn't want to let go. But I knew I had to. I had to because I needed to be saved then. Conviction is when the Holy Spirit works in your heart personally and shows you you are a sinner and you deserve condemnation. When he shows you the reality that what will happen to your soul if you die without Christ. And he brings you to the point where you understand the gospel. You know, nobody understands the Bible apart from the Holy Spirit. That's his job. He teaches us truth. Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Look at that verse again. All that the Father giveth to me. That reminds us of God's sovereign choosing. In fact, the scripture says in John 6, 44, No man can come unto me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. You would never be saved had God the Father not drawn you to salvation. That's his sovereign choice. That's true. And then man's obedient choice. All that the Father shall give unto me, what? Shall come unto me. That's when I choose to come to Jesus. And then number three, Christ's ability to save and secure. And him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. I think that's one of the greatest verses on assurance. When I have people sometimes who are struggling with doubt. And they say, well, I, I want to be saved. I'm not sure if I'm saved. I, 
I doubt whether I am sometime because they don't always live the way I should and they come with that. And I said, well, let me ask you this. Have you ever at one time in your life come to Jesus for salvation? And they'll say, yes. And I'll take them to this verse. It says, all that the Father shall give unto me shall come unto me. And him that cometh unto me, what? I will not cast out. That means if I came to Christ with the intention of giving my life to Him and and receiving Him as my Savior, He promises that He will not cast me out. He will not say no. Because you would never come to Him unless the Father drew you anyway. So my question for you this morning, it's a very personal question. Only you and God know the true answer. Have you received Jesus as your Savior? If you died this afternoon, are you 100% sure that you would end up in heaven? Or do you doubt it? Question number two, do you want to be saved? Do you want to come to Jesus and be saved? If your answer is yes, simply come by faith. Admit to Him that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus died for your sins on the cross of Calvary. <clears throat> Confess your sins to Him and be saved. It's as simple as ABC. Admit you're a sinner. Believe the gospel. Believe that Jesus died for your sins on the cross of Calvary. And confess your sins to Him. And He'll, he'll save your soul even today. So with that invitation, I want to invite you to bow your head in prayer. And as we play, uh, pray this morning, first address God yourself in your heart. Just in the silence of this moment, you know whether or not you're saved. Perhaps you've been saved, but you haven't been living like a saved person. The Lord knows that too. It may be a time for you to confess those sins to the Lord. The Bible says to believers, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe that's you. Maybe you need to confess your sin to the Lord and get back into fellowship with Him. But if you're here today without Jesus, you're not saved. You might pray a simple prayer like this. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross of Calvary to save me from my sins. Dear God, right now I commit my life to you and I believe in my heart the gospel that God sent his son Jesus to die for my sins. He was crucified. He died. He rose again to give me eternal life. I believe that. And I'm trusting that fact to save my soul. Would you please save me and help me to live for you? You know, if you pray a prayer, something like that, doesn't have to be the exact words. But if you pray a prayer like that and and you really mean business with the Lord... I believe He'll save you. He'll give you eternal life. Bread has to be eaten to have any benefit. And Jesus has to be received personally for you to have the benefit. Father, we pray right now as we're standing here in the quietness of this moment that the Holy Spirit can do something that I can't do. And let's open up the hearts of these in this room. Show them Jesus, the bread of life. And motivate them to accept Him as their Savior. Will you stand with me please with your heads bowed and eyes closed. And we're going to have a song of invitation played.